Matthew chapter number 22 this morning. <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse number 15. Then when the Pharisees, then went the Pharisees and took counsel, how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with a Herodian, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Oh, how they were wrong there. But anyway, uh, verse number 17, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? It is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar and not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Then he says, Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then he said unto them, Render unto Caesar." If I can turn the page. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him, and went their way. Now a few things. Just by way of introduction. Jesus, as always, led by the Spirit, starts teaching people about the reason he came. I mean, we could talk in verse, verse number 2. He's referring to the kingdom of heaven. Why did Christ come? to a sin-cursed world to redeem those that the Father loves so that they could be a part of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, the Bible was written, one, for you to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but after that, the Bible is your handbook on how to live a life to lay up treasures in the kingdom of heaven rather than down here where, where moth and dust and rust and water and everything else can corrupt it. No, we lay up seed incorruptible in heaven. Now, Jesus just teaching up a storm as always, right? Dare I say, he may have done a little bit of preaching, okay? But then we get down to verse number 15. Pharisees, always miserable. I mean, Jesus called them a generation of vipers. Right? Always looking to do harm rather than to do help. Well, they took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk or in his speech. Because here's the thing, there were so many people around, if they could have gotten Jesus to say one thing, where two or three people heard him, they could testify of that in court under Jewish law, and he'd be found guilty. Regardless of what Jesus had to say in his defense, two or three witnesses under Hebrew, if you could find two or three people that weren't coerced, that weren't in it together, but independent, verifiable accounts, where the person said the exact same thing, it was taken as fact. I mean, that's why when we study out doctrines, how do we determine doctrine? Well, it's got to be two or three passages in the Bible, at least, where it's talking to the same group of people about the same topic in the same context in order for you to build doctrine off of it. Right? Not rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, they were trying to rightly divide Jesus from this world. They were trying to kill him. So they sent the Herodians and some of their servants. They go down, they try to ensnare him. Okay. Thing we don't realize nowadays when they asked him, okay, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? When they say lawful, they weren't referring to Roman law, they were talking about Hebrew law. But they also knew Roman law, which was if you didn't pay your taxes, at the very least, you'd go to jail and work it off as a slave. The very worst, depending on how bad of a you know, tax fraud you were, they'd kill you. Right? It was considered a crime against Caesar to not pay your taxes. And see, Caesar being an emperor, right? or nowadays, we'd, depending on who was Caesar at the time, we'd call them tyrants. Okay, they had all power in Rome. So if you didn't pay Caesar his tax money, you were robbing from the one that ruled the empire. They didn't take that lightly. So, when the Herodians and some of the servants of the Pharisees show up, they say, is it lawful? They know the law that you have to pay Caesar. What they're asking Jesus is, what does God say about paying taxes? Is it lawful under the Mosaic law for us to have to pay taxes unto Caesar? 
No, what are they doing? Well, they've already tried to butter them up, to, you know, the verse before this. Look at verse 16. It says, They sent their disciples and the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Well, see, they were very wrong on the latter part. He cared so much for man that he came to die for man. He cared about man, but he cared enough about him to tell man the truth instead of what man wanted to hear. Okay, but then they said, we know that thou art true. We know that thou teachest the way of God. Well, they're feigning that, well, if you said that this is the way that God would do it, we're going to change the way that we live. That's not what they were going to do. Jesus called them hypocrites. Verse number 18. They said, why are y'all even wasting time? I know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. But because you asked, and because you Jesus, he gave them the right answer. He said, even though you really don't want to know, I'm going to tell you. Was it for their benefit? No, because they really weren't listening. Whose benefit was it for? Well, who's reading it some 2,000 years later? That's us. He knew that, in this case, Matthew... Right, would hear, then record, and then that the Holy Ghost would preserve all the way up to you. Well, what was the answer? First, verse number 19, he says, show me the tribute money. In other words, give me a coin. And what's it say that they brought to him? A penny. Well, a penny back then was a whole lot different than a penny today. Penny was a day's wages. Well, nowadays, nobody makes the same amount of money, depending on which job you work. Right? Even if you have the same job as somebody else, they've been there longer than you, they make more money. All right, it's called seniority and it's called raises. Right? Well, back then, a day's wage was a penny. For the average, you know, I'd say about 80% of everybody that lived under Roman rule, if you worked a day, you got a penny. Okay, and it wasn't as small as it is nowadays. It's a little bit bigger. Okay, now that penny, just like our money, it's got a few things stamped in it. Jesus said, give me the penny, or give me the tribute money. Then he says, Whose is this image and superscription? Okay, he's not even asking, you know, answering their question yet. He's starting to jog their memories. He's saying, what is stamped into it? Well, in order to stamp something into a coin, you've got to get rid of other stuff. That's what stamping is. You move everything around to make room to where stamping, all you're doing is you're adding air where there wasn't air before so that you can read it. Well, how do you do that? you got to squish things out of the way to make room. That nowadays, with printed money, well, they, do, they run it through the printer. Guess what it says on top, on bottom, usually in a couple of the corners. Now, if you hold it up to the light, it even says it in the watermark. Right? It says United States of America. Okay, even on coins today, what does it say? United States of America. Back then, they had... Rome or Roman currency in some shape or form stamped into it. Right, they probably didn't have so many phrases and slogans and everything on it. But on one side you'd have the face of Caesar, on the other side you'd have a sign denoting it's worth a penny. And then there'd usually be certain things on there to help prevent, you know, copyright. Well not copyright, uh What's it called? Counterfeiting. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, duplication of money. They had ways around that too. Jesus taught against that. But anyway, we'll get on that later. Maybe not. Wasn't in the notes. But there was something to say, this is Rome's, and to prove it, they put the face of Rome on it. It was that, the emperor. So he holds it up and he says, whose face is this? He said, Caesar's. He said, whose is the superscription? In other words, who put their mark on this? 
okay? Because I've seen a lot of pictures of other people that had some artist's name down in the bottom of it. They're saying, this isn't a piece of art that somebody signed. Who owns this coin? Whose is the superscription? They said, it's Caesar's. So, look what he says. Then he saith unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. They weren't expecting that one. Now we can break it down and do a whole bunch of reasons today on why it's right to do right. One of them things is paying your taxes, whether you like it or not. I don't like it, but I still do it. Right? Mostly because I don't like all the places that the money's going. But anyway, if I could agree to, I agree to pay this much of my taxes because you're wasting the rest of it, they wouldn't like me too much. Right? But the same was true under that time. They didn't get to tell Caesar what their tax rate was. I mean, go read Luke number two. Right when Cyrenius was governor. Right? It's getting ready to come. It's going to be on the Charlie Brown Christmas special if you watch it again this year. Right? Cyrenius is governor. Rome sent out the decree that the whole world was to be taxed. You know what that meant? Everybody was paying taxes. Do you know how serious it was? Joseph went back to the place that he was born to make sure that they got the accounting right. He said, hey, y'all remember me? Y'all remember my family? Good. Here's our tax money. Make sure that Caesar knows we paid our taxes. Right? That's how serious they were about paying their taxes. You know why they were that serious? Because the crime for not paying taxes, usually slavery or death. Okay, well, what gave Caesar the right to tax them? They're asking if it's better to give unto God or give unto Caesar. Well, by giving unto Caesar, you honor the God that put Caesar into power. No man rises to an authority or a seat of authority unless God ordains it. That's what our Bible says, isn't it? It's not God all-knowing. Didn't God know that before Caesar got elected? Well, he didn't get elected. First Caesar took over, and then the rest of them, they usually killed somebody and then took their spot. That very rarely was it handed down from father to son. And Caesar shouldn't have ever existed. But anyway, under you know the Roman law of the day. But didn't God know all that? Yeah. Didn't God know that there were going to be taxes imposed by Caesar? Yeah. But didn't God allow it to happen? If God didn't want it to happen, God would have never let the taxes happen. Now see, there are certain things that God ordains and then there are certain things that God permits. You know what God ordained? It was ordained long before the foundation of the earth that Christ would come and die for the souls of man so that man might be saved, redeemed from his sinful state. That was ordained. You know what God permits? He doesn't approve of it, but He allows it to happen. Look at all the wickedness in this world. We know that God doesn't approve of sin. We know that God doesn't authorize sin. We know that there's no way that God could even conceive of sinning. That's how holy He is. Then why does all that happen? All that happens because God's given man more time to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because he knows if he gives them what they deserve, they'd be in hell right now. The reason it is permitted to happen is because God wants to show more long-suffering and mercy and grace. God didn't ordain it. It's never God's will for somebody to sin. But see, sometimes God's permitted will or permissible will, He allows wicked things to happen so that His ways can confound the wise, can take the base things and cause them to do things that base things shouldn't be able to. Right? How often did God allow hardship to come upon the Israelites, His own people? slavery, captivity, what was the purpose of that? To get them back to the place where they relied upon God. They never would have had to have gone into it if they would have done what God had ordained, which was to be His people, called out and solely devoted unto Him. 
So he permitted something else to happen to get him back to it. What are we saying? Did God pin down somewhere in the alpha of time the taxes were going to happen? I don't know, but God permitted it to happen. That's all I need to know. We're going somewhere with this. We're not just talking about taxes today. But Jesus said, whose face is that? Whose superscription is that? They said Caesar. The implication is we know that God's greater than Caesar. He didn't even ask them about whether or not God deserved a tithe and an offering of everything. He knew that they knew that. He said, this coin, which is your day's wage, right? whose face is on it? Caesar's face is on it. Really, what he's asking is, who allowed Caesar's face to be on that coin? The answer was God. Who could take Caesar's face off of that coin? God. Who could change everything about their life if God would have allowed them to? God. They've only got the bread of life standing right there in front of them. Yet instead of believing, what do they do? They tempt, and then they try to ensnare them. For what purpose? So that people would stop listening to him and go back to listening to the Pharisees. All that being said, Okay, verse number 21, right? Jesus said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Because really, who gave those things to Caesar? God. Render those things unto God. And unto God, render those things that are God. What's he saying? If you truly believe in a thrice holy, right? omnipresent all powerful all knowing God you don't have a problem with understanding why things happen out here that's not my job you know what my job is my job is to live for him not my job to worry about whether or not I should pay my tax not my job to worry about whether or not I'm supposed to obey the speed limit the Bible says to give honor to them that have the rule over you. If it's right to pay your taxes, it's right to obey the law. Right Now, who was speeding on the way to church today? Me, because I knew I wasn't going to get caught. How'd you know that? I had some place to be. And if it makes it any better, my brother, who was is a police officer, I'm pretty sure he was speeding from the other direction and he pulled out behind me. And it wasn't in a cruiser, so I knew we were in the clear. Huh? Well, is it right? Yeah. They're saying, what's God got to say about this? It's always God's modus operandi, right? Or in other words, the way that God always does things, it's always right to do right. God gave you this thing. But really, I don't know that, but Josh. But there is something inside of us. It might have been from when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But there's something in you that knows the difference between right and wrong. Now, did God give you that, or was that a byproduct of the tree? I don't know, because before that, Adam knew it was right to do what God said, and he knew it was wrong to go and eat the fruit of that tree over there. I don't know, but it's in you. It's a part of you. If you're saved, you've got one better. You've got the Holy Ghost. To lead and guide you into all truth. Right, so without a doubt, we can say, everybody that's ever been born, right, they knew it was right to pay Caesar. They were just trying to trick him. Right, we know what's right. We know what's wrong. The Bible says, we're without excuse to look around and see that everything that is made is not made by anything else that was made. In other words, I can look at that tree and know it didn't make the grass. Right? I can look at Brother Brian and know the only thing that he's ever made is a big meal for himself. Right? That sucker likes to eat. You don't go golfing with him. You'll gain 10 pounds all the snacks he brings. I did that one time. not going to do it again. I can't afford to. I have to buy new pants. So which, I can look at Brother Brian and know he didn't make the suit that he's wearing. Right? Or make the cotton or whatever fabric it is that went into his suit. 
made the dirt that grew the fabric in order for that suit to be. I know Brother Brian didn't make that. That Bible says that man's without excuse to know that there is a God. Right? But then one further than that, we also know the difference between good and evil. So what are we saying? If we can piece those things together on our own, right? shouldn't we be able to tackle some of them simple things that people want to bring up and question all the time? So what the Lord's up this morning, we're just going to teach on render unto God. Well, render unto God what? What's God's? Well, what is His? Well, we don't have time to go do it. But by Him and through Him do all things consist? According to your Bible, what's that mean? It means He made everything. But even after He made it, the only reason that it exists is because He allows it to continue. He not only had all power to create, He has all power to keep what He has created. So what's he own? Everything. But let's be more specific. Right, we're talking to the Sunday school crowd. Right? Well, what's he own? Well, if you're saved, he owns you. Does not the Bible say that we are bought with a price? Our life is no longer our own. Why is that? Because the price to buy us was the blood of the very darling Son of God. So if God owns everything, but he owns all of us, what's he do? What do we render unto God that belongs unto God? Well, if we were to take a coin today that was your day's wages, right? Pick any day. Doesn't matter. If we were to take that coin, whose face would be stamped on it? Didn't Jesus say, whose is the image and superscription? He said, who's so important that the face was stamped in it so that people knew who it belonged to? Well, what's our day's wait? Well, we're here one minute and gone the next. Man's days is as a vapor. Here one moment, gone the next. Right? Our days with God, a thousand years is a day. And a day is a thousand years. Really? You know what our life is? It's a penny. It's a day's wages in the eyes of God. If we were to take that penny, hand it over, whose image is in it? Is it mine? I mean, sure, it's my coin, but that doesn't mean that I get billing time on the front of the coin. Now, the image is not about who owns it. The image is about identifying who owns it. Everybody in the Roman world at that time, they didn't know you know, there was Caesar, then Caesar had regional governors, then there were sub-governors, you know, there was Pilate, but then there was also Herod, and, you know, we study the Bible. A whole bunch of different positions going on in the Roman Empire. Right? A whole lot more complicated than America. In America, pretty complicated. We got 538 representatives in Washington, all of them are half crazy. Right? But if you wanted to, you could name all 538 of them, and the Internet makes it a whole lot easier. Now, you can name the president, vice president. You could name everybody that's on the Supreme Court. And for the most part, that is the bulk of the American you know, national government system. You could name, every, back then, they couldn't name everybody that was in charge of Rome. You know what I think of when I think, you know, I see Mitch McConnell? Man, that guy's old. And two... If I see Mitch McConnell, I know something with politics is going on. I think of D.C. Right? Why? Well, if you were to put Mitch McConnell's face on a coin, I assume it would have something to do with politics. Right? Well, sure, they could have put a governor's face on the coin, but not everybody would have known who the governor was. Who did everybody know? Everybody knew Caesar. Caesar's face was the face of Rome. Right? Just like that one lady... I read an article somewhere, the Gerber baby turned however many years old this year. Right? Well, the Gerber baby is the face of the Gerber company. Right? You see that little white and blue face right? that they had on everything. What do you think of Gerber, even if Gerber's not there? That's how people were with Rome and Caesar's image. 
They thought, oh, that belongs to Rome. Well, who's your life belong to? We know who it should belong to. We've already covered that. But who does it belong to? Because again, it was stamped in. Stamping requires time, force, and then, most of the time, it requires additional striking. It requires precision. You don't just take one and then, whoa, pow, image is there. No, you've got to do it multiple times. That's why back in times like this, it was very common for things to have shadow images on coins because when they would use that stamp, it moved just a little bit. And you'd get a wonky picture out of the end of it. Nowadays, if that happens because everything is so robotic and everything else, those are worth big money nowadays. The ones that have errors on them. Right, well, what did it take to get Caesar's face on that coin? Well, back in that day, it took a really big, strong dude who had a hammer with a stamp on one end, and he'd whack it a few times. But before that, what's it made out of? Precious metal. May not be the most precious, but it is precious. Right, not all coins were made out of gold and silver. Ours aren't even <laughs> made out of precious metal. You know, it's made out of tin. I couldn't even make pennies. I don't even know what they're making them out of nowadays. They're too shiny to be copper. I know that. They're made to look like copper. That's too shiny to be copper. That's not real copper. Right? But when I was growing up, it had a little bit of copper on it, but guess what the inside was? Zinc. Because copper was too expensive to make the whole thing out of copper anymore. It was more than a penny to make a penny. Well, what did they use back then? Things that had value. So what we don't realize is our life is valuable unto God. Not just our eternal life, our life now. But what do we do if we render ourselves unto Him? What does He promise to do? He promises to refine us. He promises to put new into us. Didn't He promise that He put Himself in us? And that we'd be a new creature after He made us? What's He saying? He saw value, but he's going to turn us into a precious metal. What did Job say? Though he try me, I shall come forth as gold. How did he know that? He knew that the heat, that the pressure, everything was to make him more valuable unto God. He knew what God put in him, and he knew that God wouldn't take it out of him. Because God never does something to undo it. Once God does it, it's settled. Job saying all those valuable things in me the world can't take them from me because God gave it to me. Well the coin somebody puts their face in it because it's valuable. The process takes a whole lot of time. What's the saying? You don't get to change the face that's in your coin overnight. It's not a decision. You don't wake up and just change a mask and say well I'm this person today. I don't get to walk out the door and say, I think instead of George Washington, I want Abraham Lincoln on the $1 bill today and we'll put old George on the 5 Not going to happen. Now, they tried to take Andrew Jackson off of one of them and Alexander Hamilton. You know what happened? They're both still on there. I mean, they put a guy that wasn't even president on one of them. That was a $100 bill. What are we saying? You don't get change. The image of somebody on your life. That takes a lot of long time to enforce. What are you saying? If yours isn't the face of Christ, we don't get to change that overnight. That's hard work. That's labor. You've got to reshape your entire testimony with the world because we're written epistles known and read of all men. One week, one month, one year may not be enough for you to prove that the image of your coin had been changed. You know why Caesar got his tax money? Because he was the one that made the money. It was his. That's what the superscription meant. He said, I made it. And I'm the one that promises that this coin is worth this much money. The U.S. government promises that a dollar bill is worth a dollar. You can't change that. You can try to with inflation, but a dollar is always a dollar. 
But the image on the other side, that doesn't change. Right, so who's stamped into your coin today? But then the superscription. Right, that was the guarantee, like we just said. Promise, I, I don't carry cash on me anymore. Mostly because I don't trust myself with it no more. But anyway, I buy stupid things when I have money on me. But you know what every dollar bill at some point says? Backed by the Federal Reserve. Issued by the United States of it. Legal tender for currency. That's all your promises and guarantees that that piece of paper is worth what the number on it says. That it's insured for that amount. Meaning somebody can't, you know, walk. That's why they used to bite gold coins back in the day because people make it out of fake stuff. Gold soft, the fake stuff wasn't. So if they could put a dent in the gold coin with their tooth, it's real. Nowadays, you don't have to bite coins to find out if they're real or not. It tells you right there on it. Uh, well, in our life, what's the guarantee? What's the promise? Because right, it was Caesar's superscription. Caesar made the promise. Is his face? He made the promise. This is worth good money. This is worth a day's wages. Well, what's your life? You got a promise written. What's your guarantee? Some people guarantee that if you live their life, they'll be miserable. They may not say that, but that's what the coin in their life says. Other people say if you live like them, you're either going to not have any hair or it's all going gray real quick because they worry about everything. There's no stability. Right? Some people, their life says that they care more about work than they did about their family. Some people's lives said that they didn't care about anything. Some people's lives, the guarantee on their coin, right, is a cautionary tale to everybody, don't do it like me or you'd end up like me. Right? What's your guarantee? No, it should be render unto God. What's God? What should our guarantee be? That Jesus saves, Jesus satisfies, and Jesus secures. What's that mean? He's enough to save me. He was enough to take care of all of my problems. I am satisfied, and He has secured me. Meaning, even if I wanted to, I couldn't change my station. The guarantee should have nothing to do with us. The person that handed him that coin, that it was their money, they had earned it as a day's wage, they didn't get to decide what was on the coin. It was theirs, but they couldn't change it. So why would I have say over what the inscription on my life or the superscription would say? Guarantee is not based on me. It's not based on what time of day you find me. My dollar bill at 9 a.m. is still a dollar bill at 9 p.m. The words don't change on it. Again, these are permanent things that are added to them. You know what that means? That means consistency from us. You know who really engraves that superscription on the coin? We do. We may not decide what it is, but we're the ones that put it on there. You know, out through our walk, through our talk, through actions. That superscription would be your life summed up. Very short. Even if it's still alive. Somebody were to look at you and they had to pen down your entire life into a sentence, because that's what people do. I know Matthew chapter number seven says, Judge not lest ye be judged. But guess what? People judge. You know what they are judging? Do I want to be like that person or does that person need to be like me? Because really that's what everything boils down to. Am I better than you or are you better than me? That's what the world, it's all that they see. Are you worth my time or are you not worth my time? Can I get something from this or are you just going to waste things? Am I too busy to talk to you or are you important enough that I'll make time for you? So the world operates. Well, how come when the world looks at so many Christians, they don't take a second glance? Because that image probably looks just like an image that's out there in the world. Doesn't look any different from what everybody else has in their coins. 
and the superscription probably doesn't give him anything to make him take a second thought. Take a second look. I mean, people came from all around to see John the Baptist. Yep, from the outside looking in, I think we can all agree, on paper, he sounded like a half-crazy wild man out in the middle of the woods. Right? Well, what? It, well, they went out there, clothed in camel hair, eating locusts and honey, preaching that, you know, prepare the way of the Lord. Right? At first thought, you think, that sounds a little weird. Second thought, you know, the second time you heard it, that guy's still going on? John didn't get a multitude overnight. He's out there preaching to nobody for a long time. But what happened? God sent him. Why? Because he was just constant. You know what they looked at when they saw John? They saw the forerunner. I mean, Jesus himself said no greater man was born a woman than John the Baptist. You know what that tells me? Maybe more of us went out in the woods, lived off of honey and locusts and had camel. He wasn't concerned with what he had. He was concerned about who was coming after him. He was even baptizing. That was the symbol of what was going to happen on the inside of what Jesus did on Calvary and what he'd do on the inside of you. Right? We died with him in death and trespasses and raised in newness of life. He didn't even know why he was baptizing yet, but he knew that he was baptizing. For him, it was a symbol that they were leaving their old life and following after God. But yet, Jesus gave the ordinance of baptism to the church. Well, why did he do it? He's just being faithful, doing what God told him to do. You think living out in the woods, living off of honey and locusts made a whole lot of sense to him when God told him? Probably not, but he just had enough faith that God was able to give him what he needed. Don't know where he got the camel hair, but God gave him that too. What he said, you know what his inscription says? John believed God. You know what Moses says? Moses had faith. What's yours say? The good news is that with the Lord's help, it can change. But if the world had to boil it down, would they take a second look? Everybody knew Moses was building a boat because everybody made fun of him for it. But not a one of them could say that they didn't know that a flood was coming. But Noah had faith, but Noah was faithful. He was constant. It's going to rain. Guess what? It rained. On the other side, Elijah the prophet said, God said, it's not going to rain for three years. Guess what? It didn't rain three years. But still, they didn't even see Elijah's coin. Go and study it out. They said, aren't you the man that stopped the rain? No, he wasn't. He's the man that came and told you that God was going to stop the rain. He didn't do it. God did it. Aren't you the one that sent fire down from it? No, he's the one that prayed and said, God, I did everything that you told me to do. Now you do what only you can do. Guess what happened? Fire came down from heaven. They missed his inscription, which was what? Return to God. That's what he wanted them to do. Junk all that falseness and get back to him. But if your life was boiled down, I mean, would it say, in God we trust? Like American currency? America doesn't, but it's still on the coin. Would it be on yours? Would it be more focused on where you were made or where you were headed? Would it say currency of the carnal? Or would it say currency of the heavenly home that we're headed to? Where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be also. That's what Jesus said. Now let's get back to render unto God what is God. Why? So that God can do whatever he wants to with it. The only time God can't do something is when man's will gets in the way. 
Again, we talked about the perfect will of God and the permissible will of God. God will allow things to happen and allow us to do certain things because we are free moral agents. But he will permit them to happen without just wiping us off the face of the earth. Doesn't mean it's where we're supposed to be. You know what permissible means? It means I'm one step from being in the perfect will of God, but I'm also one step being out of the will of God altogether. Dangerous place to be. But see, if I give unto God everything, you know what I'm saying? God can do whatever He wants to with everything. You know what happens when God has everything? Even if, the whole point here, He's saying, give unto Caesar what's Caesar's, give unto God what's God. You know what he's saying? If you give God what he deserves, everything, it doesn't matter how much Caesar in the world tries to take away from you, God's going to make sure you all right. He promised to provide your needs. He promised that if you sought after the kingdom of heaven, that the desires of your heart would be given unto you. If you've got everything you need and everything that you want, pretty good spot to be in. But see, if that's who we were, our coins would look a whole lot different than the coins that are floating around today owned by some so-called Christians. Because if somebody had a coin like that, you know what the world would try and do? They'd try and do what they did to the disciples or the apostles. The early church, you know why the early church was persecuted so? Because their coins told of a far-off land that was called home, told about the one that minted them, refined them, put his image in them, Gave him a new song. Gave him a superscription that rebuked the world and praised God. You know what the world did? They hated it so much they killed him. Trying to stop it out, but you know what happened? It only grew. How many persecutions you heard about lately? A part of that is, is that we're blessed to be born in America where there is freedom of religion. That don't mean nothing no more. They're taking everything else. The only reason we're able to be here today is because of the grace of God. They've already proven that if they wanted to, they'd come in and they'd take. Most of us roll over on our back and take it. You don't believe me. Everything shut down during COVID, including churches. What are you saying, Brother George? If ours looked like they were supposed to, the world would be taking note. So the question is, well, why don't they? I can't answer that for you. I already told you about the Holy Ghost. He's real good at that. Leading and guiding into all truth. You ask God in sincerity. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. But you know what I do know? Our coins need to have more of Him. Less of us. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.